Before we begin, I wanted to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land in which we gather. And here at Gordon, it's the Aramaragal people. So we want to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging, as we recognize that this land is, was and always will be sacred to our First Nations peoples. So welcome to Gordon Pimble Uniting Church. Uh, this is the second Sunday of Epiphany. Welcome to this time and place, wherever we find ourselves a place and a time consecrated for the worship of the living God, wherever we are. We are one in spirit. Those who are present physically and those who are absent, the young and the old, the healthy and the unwell, the strong in their faith and those who are wrestling with their understanding of God and faith, for those who are celebrating and those who are grieving, we all come together. We bring who we are, what we have, and all that consumes us before the Holy One. We come as we are, in despair and in celebration, seeking solace and wisdom. We come seeking peace and hope. We come together seeking God. Let us begin in prayer. Loving God, we come with a spirit of worship seeking your presence at work in us and in our lives, seeking your wisdom and your guidance, seeking your blessings and your healing. Touch and transform us today, we pray. Bless us that we may become a blessing to others. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Now, seeing we can't sing, the thought was we might do something that's slightly interactive, so I invite you to look at the, uh, the collect, and you are invited to respond with the words in bold. There are diverse gifts, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works through people in different ways, but it is the same God whose purpose is achieved through them all. Each one of us is given a gift by the Spirit, and there is no gift without its corresponding service. There is one ministry of Christ, and in this ministry we all share. Together we are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. I invite you just to remain silent. Uh, on your screens should be a, uh, a hymn, and you're welcome to just read it or look at the image. And there is a link if you choose to listen to, uh, to the hymn. I'll just give us a few minutes just to sit and reflect. We now come to a time of prayers of adoration and confession. I invite you to join with me. Uh, the prayers of adoration I'll say alone, but the, uh, the prayers of confession you're invited to join. Eternal God of love and grace, we come before you in awe and wonder. We recognize you, God, as the essence of our being, as the love and grace within all people. God, we know that you are the hope of all the peace for all, the joy for all, and the love of all. We praise you, God, our mother, our father, God of mystery and intimacy. And now in penitence and faith, let us confess our sins to Almighty God, and you're invited to join. Loving God, we have sinned against you and one another. We have sinned in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to correct what we are and direct what we shall be. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Now, having confessed our sins, hear then God's good news. In Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
I'd now like to invite Nicola, who's going to come and lead us in notices and followed by the readings. Just briefly, the notices. Um, you can find the notices on the front page of our website. Scroll down to the bottom of the page and click on there and you will find, find them. Um, just to make sure you know that we are going back online. We are back online till we're told otherwise by Synod. Um, the links to the hymns that we are, uh, are in our service today, you will find in the um, YouTube description of this service, so you can listen to the music afterwards or during the service. Um, most of our, the staff are still away on holiday, um, with the exception of myself and Steve, who will be here next week. So if you have any concerns or issues or something to put in the newsletter, please contact myself. So let us hear the word of God. This is from 1 Corinthians 12, verses 1 to 11. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same spirit who allots to each one individually, just as the spirit chooses. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the second reading from the Gospel, John chapter 2, 1 to 11. The wedding at Cana. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine, the water that had become wine, and did not know where he came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee 
and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the gospel of our risen Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm mindful in the Protestant church, we obviously do follow the lectionary, but um, I, I don't know if we um, give as much attention to seasons like Epiphany as we should. I always find it a strange reading, the second Sunday of Epiphany, when we have Jesus' first miracle or first sign in John's Gospel. And it's important to remember that he's actually telling us that the purpose of this Gospel was that we may believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and the Son of God, and in him find eternal life. And so as I was thinking about what to say regarding this text, I was mindful of the Gospel of John. It starts with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it's interesting if you study the Greek, because the way we understand and translate the word logos as word, I mean, traditionally, it should actually be translated as the dialogue, the conversation. Um, and obviously, as people of faith who believe in God as Holy Trinity, it actually helps us to maybe stop and think what it might mean that the dialogue, that God's voice, that God's speech, that God's conversation was made manifest. And this story can be a little bit distracting as well, uh, because I've found myself when I look at this story, I'm thinking about Jesus, the alchemist, turning water into wine, uh, death into life, hopelessness and despair into hope and joy. And sometimes we're looking at this story and trying to make it a little bit more pragmatic. So what does it say to me? Maybe I'm one of the servants that could put water in the jars and it can be used and turned into wine. Maybe I need to listen to my mother more uh, and listen to her voice. I I I'm not sure. Uh, it's a beautiful story, but it can become almost a distraction because the story wants us to see Jesus is more. So sometimes our focus and our attention needs to shift. Sometimes the questions we're asking need to change. I remember this uh, beautiful story. I'm pretty sure I've shared it here at Gordon United before, so excuse me if you remember it. But it's an ancient story of a Jewish man seeking to find God at work in a faith community. And the story tells us that this man seeks God through the evidence of God listening to prayer and performing miraculous signs. And so he goes from synagogue to synagogue, seeking uh, this place where God is present. And this goes on for a long time. And in his seeking, uh, unfortunately, he feels very disheartened because he can't find this place. He's almost lost hope, he's almost given up, but he hears of a wise elderly leader in a synagogue. And so we're told that he goes to this community and he explains to the wise man what he is seeking. And then the wise man explains to him that he's been looking for the wrong thing all along. The wise man says, a true miracle is finding a place where people listen to God and where people try and do the will of God. If you can find that, then you can find God at work. And I, I love that story. Uh, it's entertaining, but I love it because it has that twist. But it made me think about this text and the season of Epiphany. And I always think it's interesting. I, I love the Gospel of John, and I love these stories like the wedding at Cana. But it can almost become a distraction. In this Protestant tradition, especially, we're so into theology and the word, which is a good thing, but we can become so consumed by that that maybe we forget the bigger picture. Maybe we get a little bit too consumed with our intellectual journey and we haven't actually engaged with what the text is wanting to say. John's beginning with, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, and the word was God. John's gospel read from the start to finish leads us on a journey. I remember someone once saying, when you're going to preach, you tell people what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, and then you tell them what you've told them. 
And that's what the Gospel of John does. And sometimes we stop at one place and we forget the bigger picture. The Word of God was made manifest in human being. And the Gospel of John wants us to look at all of the stories to start to put an image together. It's a kind of spiritual pilgrimage through reading the Scriptures. I mean, this is true of all the Gospels, not just John's. But John wants us to listen and to hear. Who is this God manifest in the person of Jesus Christ? What does it mean to believe in him, to trust in him, and to cling in him and find eternal life? It's really meant to be a story that stops us on our tracks. Uh, I mean, I I find the idea of turning water into wine very exciting. Um, I haven't tried it. But it is that would be a pretty good party trick if we could actually do something like that. I remember reading some scholars who were, I think, very amusing. It was telling us even God has to listen to his mum. You know, maybe there's a message for younger people. We need to listen to our parents, particularly our mums. Of course, theologically and historically, many people believe that John was written to a community that was very led by Greek philosophy, the Gnostics, who believed that the body was bad and the spirit was good, and they wanted to humanize Jesus. It wasn't just this God in the sky. This tangible, real Jesus was a human being who lived with us and walked with us and suffered with us, who actually had a mum. I mean, you don't get more human than that. He actually had a mum. I mean, there's definitely those elements within the story. And, And then we have, I think, this beautiful text from Paul in 1 Corinthians, which I think also goes with the idea of the season of Epiphany. Epiphany is a form of revelation where our eyes are open, but it's not a revelation for the sake of revelation. It's actually about having our lives transformed and changed. And for me, the season of Epiphany is inviting us to take a closer look. In the Gospel of John, John is painting a picture of Jesus, and this is just the beginning. This is, we're told, his first sign. There are more to come. A picture is being painted. We're invited to come on this journey and to have our eyes open. And obviously, we're so comfortable with these stories, we're not as impacted by them as if we were first century uh, Christians who hadn't heard these stories before. Or we were first century Jews who were converted to the Christian faith. Because all this stuff is meant to be radical and life-transforming. It's supposed to change completely how we understand and see God. And it's the same thing, I think. And I think the interesting thing is we all know this, but we fall into the same trap of forgetting. Paul is saying that all of us have been given gifts. All of us. He names a few. He doesn't limit the gifts. But all of us have been given gifts. And he's right into community that is divided, that is competitive. And he's trying to help us to recognize that we've all been given gifts for the common good. And I think sometimes it's interesting in the Protestant church, maybe in the United Church, where we so strongly believe in the call to serve others that sometimes we think it's only serving the poor or the broken. Sometimes we limit our understanding who the poor and who the broken are whether we look at Luke's gospel or Matthew's gospel, the poor in spirit or literally the poor. One of the things that we know as Christians is all human beings are broken. It doesn't matter if we've been Christians our whole lives or we're new Christians, new converts. We're still broken. We're still needing to cling to God. We're still needing to lean on one another. We still need love and care and support. We still need to have a sense of value and worth. We still need meaning and hope. We still need a hug. We still need to know that we are loved as we are, broken and all. This story, for me, I'm mindful of the modern day United Church where we're so desperate to have young people. And I work with young people, so I love young people. I think having more young people in church is fantastic. And if we can get more in, that is a great thing. But sometimes I wonder if we've forgotten or whether we neglect those faithful servants that have been part of our congregations for decades, for many, many uh, years, who have given of themselves uh, 
without reservation, who have served, who have cared, who have loved. How we see God and the manifestation of God can't just be limited to orthodoxy or orthopraxis. I think there's so many ways we get to experience God and see God. I have one of my favourite memories, which for some reason I have actually been sharing recently, and it it happened here at Gordon Uniting Church. When it comes to God being at work, a bit like this Jewish man trying to find where is God listening to people, but where is a congregation that listens to God? And for me, there was no greater manifestation than a number of years ago when I was here And Kate and Hannah sought a same-sex blessing, and we had a meeting as a congregation and discussed it. And one of the things that I feel so proud about the United Church, but particularly I have to acknowledge here at Gordon, I know it's Gordon people now, but it happened here in this particular space, was the diversity of views. People had a different theology and understanding of God. Some people were more traditional, some people were more progressive. But what was made manifest and what was tangible and real and lived out was love. I I thought it was the most beautiful thing, a community that could come together and say, look, I'm wrestling with my own theology, but I love Kate and Hannah. That was so, so powerful. When I read Paul's letter to the Corinthians, that's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing this call not just to love others, but to recognise what other people have to give us and what we have to give them. And when I think of the story of uh, the wedding at Cana, it's just the beginning. It's actually inviting us to see God as more, to not become too comfortable and complacent in our understanding of who God is and to allow that to change the way we live our lives. God is is more. God is at work in the little things and the big things. God is tangible and real. During the season of Epiphany, if it's not something you normally celebrate or practice, I want to encourage you, especially because this week, I mean, next week it's Luke, but this week we're looking at, uh, at John, to read John's Gospel from beginning to end with the awareness that John hides nothing. I've written this that you may believe. And of course, as people of faith, we believe And we become the body and the presence of God in our community, in our homes. And for me, that's what Epiphany is about. It's about seeing God in new ways, experiencing God in new ways, wrestling with God and becoming intentional in not being complacent in our understanding of who God is and how we understand God. So I invite you to cling to God, to believe in God, to see Jesus as the Son of God, the giver of eternal life, But that's not just a thing that we say we belong to. It's a way of living and life that invites us to change how we interact and live with one another, to celebrate everyone we have in our community, our young and our old, our rich and our poor, our straight and our queer. Everybody is to be celebrated. Everybody is to be recognised as making a difference And how fortunate are we to have such a diverse community, especially in the United Church, where we can live with one another and respect and love one another. I genuinely think that uh, we should be incredibly proud of who we are as a community. I know we say this a lot as the United Church, unity and diversity, uh, but, you know, we, I think, should be so proud because it does distinguish us from a lot of different denominations. The fact that you can believe what you believe. You can have different skills and different abilities, but in this place, we love one another and we work together. And as we do that, we bring the kingdom of God into this place. So may the blessing of God be with you. And I'm going to pass it back over to Nicola, who's going to lead us in our prayers. Thank you, Lorenzo. It's lovely having you back here after so many years. These prayers were given to us um, or written and organized by Marge. So let us pray. It is still early in a new year. We have all wished one another Happy New Year. Let us pray that it is also time for renewal. 
as Jesus turned water into wine, let us come together sharing in a prayer that our lives as individuals, our life as a church community, our life as a nation, our lives as part of a wide world can embrace renewal. The parable of the mustard seed reminds us that it is through a form of dying that new life emerges. Old forms can be given new content, and so we can pray not with despair, but with hope. Let us pray using a prayer from Jabiru Abbey on the New South Wales South Coast. Remembering all who are hurting this day, our fellow citizens in flooded areas, the families of those who have died in accidents, those in war-torn areas, and those living in fear of war. The many dying from COVID each day, the sick in hospital, all our wonderful but very tired doctors, nurses, and carers, and those known to us individually. And those unknown to us in need of our prayers this day. O God of the road, of the wounded, O Christ of the tears, of the broken, in me and with me, the needs of the world, grant me my prayers of loving and hoping. Grant me my prayers of yearning for healing. I pray for the coming day and for healing within and among all people. Amen. And let us together in our homes or wherever we are, let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We've now come to the end of our service, so I want to offer a blessing. So as you go, go with the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and go out committed to loving and serving God by loving and serving one another. Amen.